Hello and welcome to the webinar series, Unlocking Historical Maps of Southeast Asia, Collections, Circulations, Publics. I'm Chang Yu Xiang, Senior Curator of the Digital Historical Maps Project at Yale and US College. This webinar series and the Digital Historical Maps Project is supported by a Singapore Ministry of Education Social Science Research thematic grant. And I would like to thank that grant scheme and the Yale and US College events team for their support in bringing this series to you. Our Digital Historical Maps of Singapore and Southeast Asia project is developing an online platform to enhance public and scholarly access to, as well as understanding of digitized early maps of Southeast Asia. The platform draws on the Southeast Asia historical map collections of our partner libraries. The Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Yale University, the Bartleyan Libraries, University of Oxford, Leiden University Libraries, and the National Library of Singapore. Our platform, as with this webinar series, will improve public and scholarly understanding of a wide range of digitized early maps of the region and offer new pathways of sense making with respect to these important resources. This evening, in the third of five webinars, we focus on the theme of collections. We have invited librarians from the institutions that host significant historical map collections relevant to Southeast Asia, some of whom are from our project's partner libraries. What kinds of maps, charts, and other navigational aids exist in institutional collections that might assist historians in pursuing their research? And how are historical maps and charts currently used by scholars? What are some of the challenges of using historical maps as sources? Before we begin, we have a couple of important administrative announcements. Firstly, we ask that you do not record or screen capture the event as it is happening. It is being recorded and will be available at a later date. And I would like to also highlight to the audience members that your audio and video will not show up during this recording. Secondly, we welcome audience questions and there will be time for our speakers to address those questions in the last half an hour of the webinar. To ask your questions, please use the Q&A function at any time during the talks. Our webinar chair will distill and convey a selection of those questions to the speakers. The chair of this evening's session is Mr. Nick Milley, who is a map librarian of the Bodleian Libraries, and he has held that position since 1992. Nick is a fellow of the Royal Cartographical Society. He is an expert in maps and map history and has curated and organized several exhibitions at the Bodleian Library, including last year's exhibition, Talking Maps, for which he also co-authored the catalog. The most recent of Nick's publications is a critical companion to the English medieval Mepe Mundi of the 12th and 13th centuries. Without further ado, may I hand the time over to Nick Milley, our S Chair of this evening's proceedings. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Siang. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to have been invited to chair this panel today. And um, what a panel we have for you. It's a veritable smorgasbord of map collections uh, from all around the world. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that we have contributions from the Netherlands, from the United Kingdom, and from the United States. And all three speakers will be able to share their expertise, and it is a serious amount of expertise that they have. There's a vast amount of experience working with these collections. And I, for one, am very excited to hear what all three of our speakers have to uh, convey. The theme is obviously collections. We've looked at circulations a fortnight ago. We looked at histories last week. So now we're moving into the libraries. And our first speaker is Martijn Storms, who has been map librarian or looking after the map collection um, for Leiden universities in the Netherlands for the past 14 years. Um, Martijn, uh, I have known Martijn, I would say, suggest for all those 14 years, um, not only does he work with the library, but he also holds uh, 
positions as the project coordinator for Cummins Atlantis near Landy Key um, as part of Brill Publishers. And he's also editor of Carte Trésor, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it, it's a very, very good um, Dutch journal on the history of cartography. Martijn has authored and co-authored numerous articles in both English and in Dutch. Um, one which I would like to highlight is Maps in the Crowd, crowdsourcing old maps in the special collections, which uh, was published in 2017. Now, the Leiden University Libraries has a terrific collection of material and it's been, seems to me to have been growing increasingly rapidly over the years. Martijn's been very busy promoting what's been going on at Leiden and doing a terrific job. So I think at this stage, all I can say is Martijn, it's your turn. So let's hear all about Dutch collections of South Asian, Southeast Asian maps and their role in scholarly research. Martijn, over to you. Thank you, Nick, for this kind introduction and thank you to all the colleagues of Yale and U.S. College in Singapore um, to um, that I am able to uh, give this talk to you this uh, evening in Singapore and this afternoon in Europe. So I will start to share my screen. I hope this is working well so what i will do the next half an hour is to give an overview of dutch collections of southeast asian maps and their role in scholarly research um, in the netherlands and um, of course um, this will be um, very dutch related uh, collections of uh, maps so uh, first uh, VOC uh, time, so the Dutch East India Company and the places they uh, were active in uh, Southeast Asia and in the 19th and uh, 20th century, the colonial period of the Netherlands East Indies. Uh, the setup for this uh, presentation uh, is first um, an overview of the Dutch collections, the main Dutch collections which can be subdivided in archives, libraries and museums. And in the last part of my talk, I will go into more detail into the role of maps in scholarly research. I will present some source publications that are published in the Netherlands in the last decades. And uh, I think the research itself can be subdivided in the map as object of study. And I will go in detail more, uh, say more about history of map collecting and circulations and uh, kind of case study uh, research was secrecy policies in the Dutch East India Company cartography. And on the other hand, maps as a source of scholarly research, so maps as object and maps as a source for other kinds of research. To start with uh, the collections, um, well, let's start with the largest and most important map collections in the Netherlands, uh, that in the National Archives in The Hague. Um, this is our uh, Dutch governmental archive uh, that uh, has all the um, archives of um, the Dutch government and ministries and so on. And um, the main map collection uh, for this audience, I think, is the collection Leupe, collection of foreign maps before 1815. Um, and uh, part of that collection is the um, maps from the VOC archives. So in the 19th century, uh, Leupe was an employee at the National Archives, took out maps of archives and put them together in one map collection. And typically 19th century practice that occurred uh, now in uh, everywhere, I think. So maps were separated from the archives. And um, um, for uh, this talk, the VOC maps are, of course, uh, the most important. But uh, there are other um, archives kept at the National Archives. And uh, I just uh, go through this list you see here. It's the archive of the topographic surface, which contains a part of the topographic mapping of in the Netherlands East Indies. Um, some archives of uh, Dutch ministries, the Ministry of Colonies, uh, has maps in uh, its collection and the archive of the Ministry of the Navy. 
uh, of which you see an example uh, in the right uh, corner. Then another important map collection at the National Archives is the archive of the hydrographic surface. Uh, so that contains nautical charts, mainly 19th, 20th century materials. And uh, the so-called 12th uh, section in that archive is concerned with maps of the Netherlands, East Indies and Southeast Asia. Then there is a collection of printed maps of East and West Indies, um, which of course contains a lot of maps of the East Indies, so Southeast Asia too. And to finish with, uh, in the collection of acquisitions, maps of Southeast Asia are kept as well. And I want to thank uh, Gijs Boink, my colleague of the National Archives, to help me to compile this overview of the main archives in the National Archives. Um, part of the um, collections uh, in the National Archives are available online on the website of the National Archives. You saw the URL at a previous slide. And um, you can specifically look for maps. And when I did just an example, uh, I typed in Indonesia, Dutch, and then I got uh, 210 hits uh, of maps related to uh, Indonesia or Netherlands East Indies. And when we click on the first link, we see this uh, as an example, uh, 1665 manuscript map of the island of Ambom by Johannes Fingbooms, just as a, an example of a map in the VOC collections archive. Um, they are in high resolution and it's uh, even um, possible to download these images for free. Then um, I move over to uh, the university libraries in the Netherlands. There are about 14 university libraries, but I think uh, it's fair to say that three uh, libraries uh, contain the most important map collections. Uh, first of all, uh, my own library, Leiden University Libraries. Uh, I will come back to that in more detail, but there are three main collections are the Bodel Nijnhuis collection, the collections of the Royal Tropical Institute, and the collection of KITLV. Then there is the Amsterdam University Library, um, now called Alla Pearson in Amsterdam. Um, their main collection is the collection of the Royal Dutch Geographical Society. Come back to that later as well. And the third main library is the University Library of Utrecht. And a collection in that library is the collection MOL. So uh, these are really the three largest map collections in library university libraries uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and also uh, for what concerns the Southeast Asia maps. Uh, some examples uh, in the upper left corner, we see a map of the University of Amsterdam, the famous map of Southeast Asia, which has the uh, depiction of spices in the lower right corner, a match of a map of which I uh, am uh, a bit jealous that it's not in our uh, collection. And uh, in the lower left corner, the famous Bougainese charts of the Indonesian archipelago at Utrecht University Library which was exhibited about five years ago in the National Library of Singapore. Then I move over to Leiden University Libraries. Um, this is an overview of all the Asian related maps in our collections. I won't go into all the sub collections, only the three uh, bold ones. So first about the nine house collections, which, which has about 6,000 Asian maps of which the largest part is uh, pre-1900. Uh, the collection of the Royal Tropical Institute, which can be subdivided in a colonial collection, 1920 and early 20th century maps of the Netherlands East Indies and a modern map collection. And uh, the collection of the Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, which has about 15,000 maps of Asia, of which 3,000 are before 1900. Okay, um, then I go on to the collection uh, Bodel Nijenhuis. Oh, let me see. Um, um, Bodel Nijenhuis was a 19th century private map collector in Leiden, 
and uh, he was as well a um, publisher. He ran, ran a publishing house in Leiden and a bookseller and an auctioneer. But far and foremost, he was a great collector of cartographic and topographic material. Um, I think he is one of the largest private map collectors who have has ever lived, uh, maybe comparable with David Rumsey today. And his collection is very uh, uh, variable. So it has VOC charts on vellum, uh, manuscript maps, uh, printed maps, and so on. An example of a manuscript map of the fortress at Bantam as part from a uh, 18th century series of VOC fortification plans from the 1770s. Um, then I move on to the collection of the um, Royal Tropical Institute. This institute was based in Amsterdam. People who uh, attended the ICHC conference in Amsterdam last year, they maybe remember that it took place in the building of the Royal Tropical Institute. Unfortunately, in 2013, uh, this institute had to close down its library and at that time, its heritage collection, as well as its complete map collections, were transferred to Leiden University libraries. Um, so, um, in the beginning, it was a colonial institute, so it uh, collected maps of the Dutch colonies, so for the largest part, that means maps of the Netherlands. East Indies from the 19th and early 20th century. And after the independence of Indonesia, the institute changed to an organization uh, more into uh, studies to, of developing countries. And they started to collect modern map series of all developing countries in Latin America, Africa, and large parts of Asia. Here are some examples of the maps in that. Uh, heritage collection, colonial collection of the Royal Tropical Institute. A year later in 2014, the Leiden-based uh, Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies had to close its library too. And again, the collections were transferred to Leiden University Library. Um, the KITLV is really a research institute. They also organized um, mm -hmm. Um, expeditions to Indonesia. They studied uh, culture and uh, um, landscape of uh, the Netherlands East Indies and they mapped it uh, as examples. On the left you see a copy of an English chart uh, of uh, Singapore of 1827 and on the right a manuscript plan of the royal tombs at Pasargede near um, Yogyakarta on the island of Java. And uh, you see this map is in Japanese script. So in this collection, there's also a Dutch translation of, of the map. So as an example, that this was really part of, of one of the uh, researches uh, carried out by KLTLV. They studied these graves, these cultures of uh, the uh, local people on the island of Java. All these collections are now uh, being made available in our digital collections. You can see the URL uh, below. Um, we have a general entrance to our maps and atlases, but also uh, we define specific uh, collections and subsets of, of digitized maps for the uh, Dutch colonial maps of the Royal Tropical Institute, as well as the maps from the collection of KITLV. Um, the uh, Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam, before their maps were transferred to Leiden, uh, developed its own map viewer, which was especially for that time, about 15 years ago, I think, very sophisticated um, uh, viewer um, based on an extensive uh, place name gazetteer. So you can type 
in any place name in Indonesia, and then you will find all the maps on which that place is uh, is uh, located. So there are coordinates linked to these place names, and, and the maps are uh, georeferenced, and on that base, uh, the link uh, can be made. So a uh, very important source and still available online, the um, map viewer of the Dutch colonial maps of the KIT collection. You can also uh, refine your results by a specific period or a type of map or scale. And a very important feature of this viewer is that you can navigate through um, map series. So here I uh, search for the village of Ubud on the island of Bali, and I get this uh, a sheet of a topographical map series of the island of Bali and in the upper right corner you can see the arrows so when you click on that you can navigate to the uh, adjacent uh, sheets of this topographic map series. Then I move over to the collections of the other uh, two main university libraries in the Netherlands. First the Amsterdam University Library, an important collection related to Southeast Asia is the collection of the Royal Dutch Geographical Society, an organization that organizes expeditions uh, to um, the Southeast Asia as well. Um, and as part of their loan from 1880 is a set of manuscript maps related to these expeditions of which, of which you can see an example here. And part of the collection of the Royal uh, Geographical Society is the Muller collection. That yeah, was a collection um, brought together by Frederick Muller, who was an antiquarian bookseller in Amsterdam, an auctioneer, a bibliographer, but also a collector. And his uh, collection of about 10,000 atlas maps, of which you can see an example on the right, uh, is kept at Leiden, uh, is kept at Amsterdam University Library as well as part of that uh, collection of the Royal Topographic Society. And then the University Library of Utrecht. I just want to highlight uh, one collection there. It's the collection of Gerrit Moll, who was an other kind of collector. He was not a bookseller or auctioneer or so, but he was a scientist and mathematician and professor at Utrecht University. And he collected a, a collection of maps of about 1500 maps, if I'm right. And that collection contains um, uh, among many other things, uh, six or seven VOC charts on vellum and this um, manuscript chart of Southeast, of a part of Southeast Asia, with um, uh, which is signed by um, Abel Tasman. Then uh, to the museums. Um, there are two main um, museums with map collections in the Netherlands, and, and that are the two uh, maritime museums. First, the National Maritime Museum, Het Scheepvaart Museum in Amsterdam, um, which uh, base was formed by the collection Mensing, and in Rotterdam, the Maritime Museum Rotterdam, uh, and the map collection there was um, um, the um, base of that collection is the collection Engelbrecht and there's also recently or recently in 2005 they um, uh, purchased the Corpus Christi collection collection of 14 VOC charts um, which were kept at the Corpus Christi College in Oxford. Okay then um, the Scheepvaart Museum the National Maritime Museum Amsterdam, uh, but the foundation of the map collection there was laid, laid by uh, Anton Mensing, who was an art dealer and a later owner of the Frederik Muller auction house in Amsterdam and a collector as well. And that collection uh, mainly uh, is a collection of atlases, globes and navigational instruments. Then Rotterdam, uh, uh, a bit more detail about uh, collector Willem Anton Engelbrecht, who was a shipping magnate in Amsterdam or a, a harbor tycoon, if you want. And he is the only uh, a collector of all the collections I've mentioned that was born in Southeast Asia. 
uh, namely in the city of Chirabom on the island of Java in 1874. And he collected uh, not a very big, but a very high quality collection of maps and uh, also manuscript maps related to Southeast Asia and the Dutch East India Company. Uh, that uh, for the um, collections. Now I move over to the source publications, and I think a good starting point um, to uh, explore these all these collections is the Atlas of Mutual Heritage, an online um, a website with uh, maps from all the all the collections I mentioned, as well as. Uh, collections from outside uh, the Netherlands as well. So basically this uh, collection um, of this website has uh, maps, topographical images, but also photographs of uh, materials related to the Dutch East India Company as well as the West India Company. So have a look at there. Um, then uh, some other publications. Um, I think the most important uh, series of um, source publications published in the Netherlands in the last decades is the seven volume series Comprehensive Atlas of the Dutch United East India Company, of which you can see the first three volumes now published between 2006 and 2010 and after the first general volume uh, six uh, more regional focus volumes were published of which volume two and three are the most important for southeast asia volume three is focused on the island of java and madura and volume three three on the wider um, indonesian archipelago as well as oceania and other volumes uh, um, um, have the maps of Africa, uh, western part of Asia, so the Middle East and uh, India, a separate volume on Ceylon, so Sri Lanka, and a volume on East Asia. Um, and they are now running a project to make this series uh, available online. It's not uh, done yet, but they are working on it. And as, uh, as soon as I know, I will let you know that that's available. And these series contain um, mainly manuscript materials in uh, all these archives uh, I mentioned. And it's more extensive than, the, uh, or there are more maps in this series than there are available on the Atlas of Mutual Heritage. Some other publications. Um, I want to mention the work of Professor Gunther Schilder. Uh, I think the most important work in this uh, for this audience is his 2010 book Sailing for the East, which he compiled together with Hans Koch, which contains a catalog of all known manuscript charts on vellum of the Dutch East India Company. And more recent uh, works are his monograph on early Dutch maritime cartography, the so-called North Holland School of Cartography, who produced charts in the period before the Dutch East India Company was established. And his latest work, again, together with Hans Koch, is the work Sailing Across uh, the World's Oceans, which contains a catalog of Dutch charts printed on vellum. Yeah, some examples of other source publications. Um, the Comprehensive Atlas of the Netherlands East Indies, which has 19th and 20th century maps from the colonial period of the Netherlands East Indies, compiled by Rob van Diessen and Professor Ormeling. And some other works you can see below is a bibliography on city plans of Batavia a facsimile of the Corpus Christi collection in Rotterdam I mentioned, and a monograph by Ruud Pesi on um, the maps that were produced for the Zealand Chamber of the Dutch East India Company, just to name a few recent titles. Then I want to finish with um, the map as, um, as object of study, um, of the maps for scholarly research. First, the maps as object of study. Um, the history of map collecting um, is an important part of that. I want to focus on that. And the foundations of this type of study was laid in the dissertation by Professor Kuman, Collections of Maps and Atlases in the Netherlands, Their History and Present State published in 1961. 
And a more recent um, dissertation is made by Erlen de Groot, the world of a seventh century collector, the Atlas Blau van de Hem. And this is the collection of uh, Laurens van de Hem, uh, who had an uh, Atlas Maya by Blau and added a lot of material uh, uh, to that atlas, which ended up as a 54 volume um, uh, series of atlas. Um, Atlas volumes in uh, now kept at the uh, National Library of, of Austria. And uh, part of that Atlas Blau van der Hem is the eight volume so called secret uh, VOC um, volumes, which contain manuscript material based on VOC charts. Then um, I want to say briefly something about uh, research towards secrecy policies of the Dutch East India Company. Um, in his dissertation published in 1998, K. Sandfleet, who was a former head of the MAP um, uh, collection of the National Archives, uh, published a dissertation mapping for money, and in that he kind of nuances the secrecy policies of the uh, Dutch East India Company, and he argued that um, publishers like Blau and Van Keulen, who also were um, official map makers of the VOC, were not that um, limited to publish VOC material. I don't really agree with uh, that view, and I recently published some articles uh, about this um, um, conflict of interest of the Blau and Van Keulen mapmaker families, uh, and I think they were limited. So when I compare the commercial output of a publisher like Blau in his atlases uh, with his greatest competitor, Johannes Jansonius, you see that Jansonius put much more uh, detailed maps, uh, chart-based maps of Southeast Asia in his atlases, of which you can see some examples uh, in this sheet. We see especially uh, the maps of uh, Sumatra, Borneo, and Java, which are based on VOC charts. And you would never find this kind of maps printed, uh, published uh, in atlases by Blau. And of course, Johans uh, Jansonius wasn't working for the Dutch East India Company, so he was not limited to uh, these restrictions. Then I finish with uh, the map as source for scholarly research. Um, it's not possible to give a complete overview for that, but just some uh, ideas for which maps can be an important source. Uh, first and foremost, the reconstruction of historical landscapes. And I think for this kind of research where maps are used, um, it's very important to uh, georeference maps. So we did a georeferencing project in the past years called Maps in the Crowd, where it was a crowdsourcing project. Everyone who was interested could help us to uh, geolocate uh, these maps. You see a result here in this sheet, um, topographical map series of the islands southeast of Singapore. Uh, and you can put all these sheets next together uh, on the right place, and you can use the information of these maps in GIS, geographical information systems, to analyze this uh, further. And other, uh, uh, yeah, other kinds of historical geographical phenomena can be uh, uh, studied with maps too. And just as an ex example, I name here uh, research to slavery. Um, the, in the, within the Dutch East India Company, uh, well, slavery was, uh, was there, and uh, sometimes this is reflected uh, in maps as well. So you can use maps to um, make uh, this practice of slavery visible. And a third example I want to mention is uh, toponymy research. So that can vary from uh, the Dutch who were uh, giving names to locations and places in Southeast Asia, were they using local names, were they using Dutch names. A lot of research is done about uh, this kind of topics, but uh, more recent topographical maps are also used, for instance, to analyze uh, variety in dialects or local languages in uh, Indonesia. So, Maybe we can discuss uh, these kind of things further uh, uh, in the discussion session. But for now, I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Martine. That was an absolutely terrific um, introduction to map collections in the Netherlands, not just Leiden, but we got to see examples of other collections within the Netherlands and their relevance towards the mapping of Southeast Asia. And I think that's a wonderful introduction for today's session. Now, we started in the Netherlands and a look at the work of largely the, the Dutch East India Company. Our next speaker is Tom Harper. Now, Tom is the lead curator of antiquarian mapping at the British Library. And if my memory serves me correctly, the British Library holds over four million maps. So there's plenty to choose from there. And we're looking forward to Tom guiding us through uh, the collections there. Also, the fact that the India office records are part of the British Library's collections. And this now looks at the British East India Company as opposed to the Dutch East India Company. And the India office record has a collection of what over 100,000 maps. Now, Tom um, has curated a variety of exhibitions at the British Library. Um, I can think of magnificent maps or lines in the ice and maps of the 20th century, are just three which spring to mind. He's also written prolifically on the British Library's collections and cartography in general. And so, without further ado, I would love to introduce Tom and he will be talking on an evolving archive, Southeast Asia, and the India Office map collection at the British Library. So Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and thank you very much to the organizers uh, of this uh, webinar for inviting me to speak. Hello, everyone. Among the rather more showy map collections that make up the map library of the British Library, is a less flamboyant beast. This is the map collection of the British East India Company. And pre 1947 Government of India, known as the India Office map collection based in London. It's part of the India Office records, which passed to the British Commonwealth Office following Indian independence in 1947 and reached the British Library as a place of deposit in 1982. The collection consists of around 100,000 historic printed and manuscript maps, charts, plans, atlases, itineraries, memoirs, gazetteers, and many other materials. Its principal geographical focus is the area of modern India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma, but it also takes in adjacent areas and more generally British imperial activity across the world. Now, in many ways, it is the archetypal imperial map collection, supporting, as it did, the activities of one of the world's largest colonial endeavours. And its value to the researcher in the humanities, including geography, area studies, colonial and post-colonial studies, and many other fields, is considerable. Yet it is a mercurial and complex collection. For example, there are very significant gaps in the collection, particularly in early maps from the 17th century. There are a few of the rather extravagant maps that Martin Storms has just wooed you with. Additionally, its 400 year history has seen it pulled in various different directions that have made it perhaps a less intuitive or straightforward collection to work with. In introducing the India Office map collection with particular emphasis upon the study of Southeast Asia today, I'd like to focus upon three areas. Firstly, what was the history of the collection and how does it inform its current state? Secondly, what are the kind of research questions that can be asked of the collection? And finally, bringing in more general points, what are some of the key issues for researchers concerning map collections and how are these issues to be overcome? To begin with then, I'd like to try and describe the collection's history and Southeast Asia contents. Now, as one might expect, the vast majority of the collection, as much as 70%, relates directly with the area corresponding with British India. Other parts of Asia, including the Middle East and Southeast Asia, make up around 10% of the collection with seed charts and other 
15 or so percent. But one way of understanding the collection is to view it chronologically as four overlapping phases. And these correlate roughly with its different types of cartographic material, which in turn follows the pattern of British activity in South and Southeast Asia. The East India Company was given its Royal Charter and exclusive rights to trade with the so-called East Indies in 1600. Maps were produced and used to support developing trade activity in the area of the Indian Ocean. The first sight we get of maps in the company archives was, according to Andrew Cook, when they were mentioned as unwieldy documents kept in a large chest in the company's courtroom, ever it were thus. Unfortunately, very few maps from this period survive, and one reason for this is undoubtedly the blurred distinction between what was considered official and public property on one hand, and personal and private property on the other. The India Office map collection is certainly not the only one to have suffered from official documents, including maps, finding their way into the collections of people and officials who maintained it. Now in Britain, one notorious beneficiary was King George III, who as part of his at least nominal role as head of state was supplied with official maps in order to carry out his kingly duty and he forgot to return them. For example, there are official military board of trade maps of Eastern North America from the 1760s in his collection. George III's topographical collection contains a number of maps for which examples must also have existed in the East India Company collection. For example, this map, the, the William Baffin map of 1619, produced following the embassy of Sir Thomas Road to the Emperor Jalangir, one of the inaugural cartographic expressions of British interest in India. Some early maps do survive in the collection. For example, this chart of the Malabar coast of 1705 was probably included in a letter dispatched to London from India at that time. Other early maps are represented by 19th century hand-drawn copies of Dutch and Portuguese originals, such as this one in the Dutch National Archives. So, you know, this is sort of precedent for digitization today. The second phase of the development of the India Office map collection coincides with a period of consolidation and control of the East India Company. And we can see this reflected in two principal areas of mapping. Firstly, a program of survey mapping began, which went on to include topographical, revenue, trigonometrical surveys. Under regulations of 1779, surveyors were required to surrender all of their maps to the company in London. James Rennell, the first surveyor general, brought his manuscript maps of Bengal, including this one, with him when he returned to London in 1788. William Farquhar's maps of Singapore were received at East India House on the 18th of June, 1824. And we know that because it is written on the map. Maps accompanied increasing East India Company activity in the Malay Peninsula. For example, there are original sketch maps by Thomas Forrest of the mouth of the Perak River. A few decades later, military and marine surveyors were able to consolidate company inference with more highly finished military maps, such as this map, map of Pulau Penang in 1820. A second area of mapping from this period are the hydrographic charts produced by Alexander Dalrymple and his successors from the 1760s onwards. Now these are engraved charts in various editions of waters and coasts pertinent to company activity. Rather like Blau in Amsterdam over a century earlier, Dalrymple collected and compiled information for his charts from company ships, logs, maps, and other sources, which were then in turn dispersed to ships. The chronology of these charts is fascinating for how they follow and anticipate company activities. Dalrymple's work was also concerned with improving navigation with Britain. And this track chart was one of the blank charts without coastlines so as not to invite false plotting that he issued to pilots to fill in and return to improve. With this exception, Dalrymple's compilation material is not in the collection, which he bequeathed to the Admiralty. 
the collection as we understand it today is largely a product of the second half of the 19th century. Now, this isn't especially surprising since this is the period where large map collections formed elsewhere, including this idea of the national map collection. The British Museum's map collection begins in earnest in 1867. The Bibliothèque Nationale's rather earlier in 1828, the Library of Congress Hall of Maps and Charts in 1897. Map collections became, to use Mike Heffernan's term, specialized repositories of ordered spatial knowledge, things that supported imperial activity, both practically and symbolically placed at the centers of the, their empires. And this was very much the concept behind the reconstituted India office map collection as it became following the liquidation of the East India Company after the Indian rebellion in 1858. The head of this new geographical department, Clements Markham, stated that a map collection was an essential element in the home government of a great colonial power, writing about it in the same breath as the Imperial Portuguese map archive, map archive Archivo General de Indias. The East India Company felt themselves very much to be the inheritors of this first European imperial power in, the, in Southeast Asia. And it was for this reason that company officials commissioned a life-size copy of the Frau Mauro world map of 1459, which showcased Portuguese areas of influence to, hand, to hang in the company chambers, most probably. This was a period of significant change for the collection. It was giving a, given a geographical arrangement, which today coexists rather awkwardly with the archival arrangement that followed. Maps and geography related items, including atlases and letters, were stripped from the rest of the India office records and added to the collection. This continued in the 20th century for, with, for example, the removal of maps from the political and secret files of the India office records into flat storage for preservation reasons. But it was also a period of substantial losses for the collection. Markham's catalogue of 1878 was updated after this time to reflect the losses. Significant quantities of material were sent to India in 1860 and again in 1924 including compilation material for uh, sea charts, Indian surveys and large scale urban plans, all of which, as you can see, has been crossed out in the catalog. The final phase of the evolution of the collection is unsurprisingly the one that is most recognizable today, the collection as a 20th century large scale printed topographical series map collection. And its key resource is the series mapping of the Survey of India, which was set up in 1877 by amalgamating the various topographical revenue and trigonometrical strands of official mapping. And the India office collection continued to play a key role as a sales office for the Survey of India sheets, and it was also the place of deposit for record copies. As a consequence, the collection has the best set of historic Survey of India maps anywhere in the world at least six main sets of 30,000 sheets at four principal scales in successive editions. And the coverage of the survey stretches eastwards as far as Burma. The collection continued to develop after the closure of the India office, and as a result, it holds 20th century official and military series maps of other parts of Asia, including Malaysia, China, Thailand, and Japan. So, so that's a very brief history of the collection with some relevance reference to Southeast Asia. When considering it as a resource for research, I think there are three points that are particularly relevant. Firstly, it's clear that collection was an evolving one that changed in order to meet different circumstances and demands over time. It was shaped by these demands, such as the need to maintain standards for English hydrographic charting or to manage the sale, sale of Survey of India maps. Map collections are actually incredibly diverse in the roles they play, but very few collections have played so many different roles as the India office map collection. I, I should caveat that by saying that collection may have been shaped by external forces, but I don't think we should ever see it as in any way passive or mutable due to the active support it gave to military, navigational, commercial, and administrative activities, all of which of course is of singular value to the researcher. Secondly, the collection was a working collection for practical use, 
and this exerted a heavy toll on the material itself. We have evidence that the collection was even mistreated. Clements Markham described maps, journals and records left to rot and perish and even sold as waste paper. A couple of years ago, the British Library was able to acquire early copper printing plates from the 1780s from a scrap metal dealer. Plates from the East India Company that had been lost during the move of premises in 1860, most probably. Former collection archivist Andrew Cook found another such plate being used as the mudguard of a trailer on a farm in Eastern England. Unlike other map collections, particularly private ones, the maps were not prized luxury collector items. They were valued for the information they contained rather than the objects they were. And this led invariably to damage and deterioration over time. My third point is that the relationship between the map collection and the records of its parent archive is incredibly important and valuable for researchers. The maps can be used in conjunction with the files, for example, the factory records, the records of the various departments, such as public works, surveying office, or the political and secret department. And then, of course, there are the other related collections in the British Library, including the private papers of British government and company officials and administrators which can often provide a different perspective on the official record. And also the papers of such figures as the late 17th century merchant, Thomas Bowery. Now Bowery also produced an atlas of charts describing his journey to the East and the, the, the Singapore map is here, the map of the Singapore Straits. And this is in the collection of Sir Hans Sloan. He also produced an English Malay dictionary, the manuscript draft of which is also in the India office records. There is the India office photograph collection comprising a quarter of a million images produced from 1850 onwards. And of course, there are the parallel map collections in the British Library, which complement the India Office map collection and even interact with it, as demonstrated by the topographical collection of George III. Now, the K-top, as we call it, which reached the British Museum in 1824, was collected along very different lines, i.e. it was a monarch's personal collection, with themes of art, culture, antiquarianism. The relevant maps of Southeast Asia number in the low hundreds and amongst them are key pieces which overlap with East India Company activity. For example, the vast copper plate Kangxi Atlas from 1719 by Matteo Ripa has been hand annotated in Italian red ink by the author so that George I could read it properly. Ripa returned to Europe from China on an East India Company ship the map marks the beginning of serious British interest in India. William Hack's East India pilot represents the extent of English maritime knowledge and company influence at the beginning of the 18th century. George III acquired Dalrymple's own copy of another Hack Atlas at the sale of his library in 1810. The 1739 copper plate map of Manila by Antonio Fernandez de Rojas bears annotations possibly by George III reflecting on actions taken during the siege of Manila in 1762 in which the town was looted. There are a number of official East India Company maps of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, including a manuscript map of Great Andaman produced the year the island was colonized. I'm happy to announce that um, 18,000 digital images from the King's topographical collection will be made freely available on the image sharing site Flickr Commons next week on the 13th of October. So look out for that. The other collection to take note of is the British Library's main geographical library collection. Now, this is the second largest map collection in the world with 4 million maps, thousands of mainly printed maps relating to Southeast Asia and its parts, beginning with the early 16th century Italian maps. Probably the most consistent set of maps are the British sea charts by Norrie, Imray and the Admiralty, which were received by legal deposit and are therefore remarkably complete with sequences of subsequent editions. These maps are complemented by the considerably earlier Portaland charts acquired, particularly at the start of the 19th century. Now these charts, such as this Portuguese one of around 1822 of the Indian Ocean, are useful to researchers through their proximity to some of the earliest encounters. Now I've tried to establish um, how the India Office app collection is research enriched by the collections around it. I've been asked to say something about what sorts of things researchers use maps for. I have to say it would probably be easier to say which research areas maps may not be used for, 
in the humanities. Um, and since I'm most probably speaking almost entirely to researchers who use maps in their studies and know perfectly well what they're used for, um, what I would like to do is just give a few examples of some of the most common ways in which early maps from the East, from the India Office collection are used. And I'd like to arrange them into what I see as two overlapping methodologies. Firstly, research using the information or data contained in maps, maps as images, what maps show. And second, research which treats maps as artifacts or objects, what the maps are. Now, firstly, and most obviously, historic maps carry spatial information regarding places and things. These places may have changed or even disappeared. And this historical information enables a researcher to study these places as they were to compare the past with the present and reflect upon what this evidence means. And one of the earliest inquiries I received on the India office maps was from a researcher who was looking for a village in India that had been destroyed by an earthquake in the 1890s, quite simply to learn where his family had come from. Scale maps let researchers see the past at a human level. Large scale maps of urban centers such as Singapore here show the town as it existed, features that may no longer exist, features that inform the study of a place's urban archeology, span its architecture, it, its cultural history, its colonial history. For researchers of political geography or international relations, early maps are valuable sources of information on, for example, the nature of borders or dividing lines, lines in the sand or lines along a river. The legal status of boundary maps can make them important sources for the study and interpretation of international law. Researchers have also used the interpretation of such maps for the study of nationalism and statehood. Individually, maps can be valuable historical sources, but a range of maps have further research value through ability to record developments, inconsistencies, or patterns of change over a period of time. Now, this is convenient for maps produced as successive updated editions with the same sheet lines or coordinate systems and conventions, such as admiralty charts and series mapping, both of which the India Office Map Collection is very well restored, um, resourced with. When digitized and geo-referenced, the geospatial data from maps is able to be extracted, analyzed and manipulated in order to ask fresh research questions or old questions in new ways, something that I think will be the subject of next week's webinar here. Now, the British Library has been geo-referencing its collections for a number of years now, um, and there are a number of researchers working with the library's geospatial data. One project based at the University of Toronto is using early India office maps of Chennai and Kolkata to create an online interactive layered map that explores the city's complex urban ecology, particularly their water infrastructure and their vulnerability to flooding. Now, this research hopes to demonstrate timelines of change and to provide support for further users, including social scientists, environmental campaigners, and social housing advocates. Now, of course, it isn't just what a map shows, but what it doesn't show. Um, and just as computer vision techniques are able to analyze geospatial data, they will also be able to identify gaps in that data. And related to this is research that analyzes how maps show what they show, their appearance, so from the intensely codified content of Survey of India maps that makes them ideal for digital humanities research techniques to the more naturalized maps which provide different clues for the researcher, such as, for example, maps like Mark Wood's manuscript survey of the area around Calcutta, the researcher can consider the way in which the map is drawn to resemble a luscious and profitable agrarian landscape. And of course, it's a great example of a map maker making a very pretty map in the hope of securing a promotion. This more subjective and sideways approach to looking at maps takes us to a further research method whereby maps are studied as artifacts. Now this series has already shown examples of research which begins with a map as an artifact. Treating maps in terms of what they are in conjunction with what they show was really the bedrock of map scholarship, certainly up to and even beyond the 1980s. This classification, this description and sequencing of maps of a certain place, a map maker or era known as carto bibliography. Now, as Martin has explained, projects such as um, the, the Atlantis Neolandici, the Explocart map series, sources, gathers and describes large groups of maps, which provide the basis for further studies and makes the work of map curators vastly easier. 
early Southeast Asian cartography has benefited from numerous researchers' work along these lines. There's also the more interventive art historical method of starting with the map and interrogating it, seeking to ask questions of why, where, and by whom it was produced, the processes taken to produce it, and the wider processes it went on to inform. What does the map mean? Examples that spring to mind are the work on mid 19th century Burmese maps in the India Office map collection, um, collected by a company official. There are other examples in Cambridge University Library. Um, Dr. Diana Langer, of course, has done similar uh, things with the approach with the Wise collection of maps in the British Library. And of course, there is the work done in, by Philippine scholars on the map by Pedro Murillo Velarde. All of these research areas and approaches are scalable and they can naturally inform the study of broader historical narratives. The study of exchanges and encounters in geography, circulations and networks of knowledge, and of course, colonial studies, the role of geographical knowledge and empire, mapping as a form of control and domination, and other controversial aspects of company rule and archives. I think we've yet to see a genuine large scale study that effectively uses maps and the India Office map collection in this particularly compelling and relevant research area. Research materials such as maps must remain valid and relevant for researchers in order to justify their existence. They also need to be accessible to all who require them. Now, as a, a publicly owned collection, the British Library's maps are available in London for anyone who has a research need to come and study. The past 10 years has seen an exponential increase in digitized map collections and quantities available free on the web. The experience of the last six months has made it even more apparent that there needs to be an intensification of this process so, so that collections can be made available remotely, even to those who are actually in closer proximity to our physical site. The British Library is committed to making its digital heritage accessible to everyone. We've been digitizing our collections for over three decades, and this includes portions of the India Office map collection. There's still a long way to go, but through partnerships such as that with the Qatar National Library, and through programs such as Heritage Made Digital, we're making our way through our 160 million items and 4 million maps. Our long-term strategy is that when digitized, all of our maps will go onto the British Library's viewer. But we are also, in the meantime, able to make our digitized maps available in other ways. For example, the collections um, from our War Office archive and Auden survey collections are available on Wikimedia Commons. As part of a project two years ago with Ritsu Meikin University in Kyoto, the library's collection of Japanese produced maps is available by Ritsu Meikin's Map Warper tool alongside maps from other collections. And maps of Singapore and Southeast Asia um, digitized, thanks to the generous support of Judith and William Bollinger, are freely available on the website of the National Library Board Singapore. The India Office map collection is not a single entity, but a fragmented one with parts in other library collections, um, collections in the British Library, other UK institutions, and collections across the world, particularly in India. Now, this isn't actually that unusual, as we've seen from the similar state of the, the VOC map collection and other collections that Martin described. If it's possible for gaps between digitized map collections to be dissolved through digital initiatives such as IIIF, as well as other initiatives that unlocking historic maps of Southeast Asia looks to stimulate, then this would be extremely beneficial for researchers. I'd also be interested to know how we can capture the physicality of maps and map collections in the digital environment in order to exploit the research value that is contained in their scale, their materials, their settings and their presence. Using maps for the data they contain is, is perfectly consistent with how the India Office map collection was used by company officials. But I don't feel that this fully realizes maps research potential. As a digital image on a screen, this vast 1805 facsimile of the Fram Mara world map gives the researcher a great deal, but not an appreciation of the map as an imposing object on the wall of an exclusive space, interacting and influencing the behavior and decisions of those in its presence. Maybe virtual reality, multi-spectrum 3D imaging are potential answers, but certainly everything should be on the table if we wish to unlock the true potential of early maps for research. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tom. Another terrific presentation. And I particularly enjoyed the way that Tom was looking at practical research and responding to the collections. So that's something more for us to think about as the, uh, the session progresses. Now, our final speaker is Margit Kay. And Margit is from the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. Um, now that, the map collection at Yale moved, certainly the pre-1920 material, moved to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library in 2016. And it's thanks to Margit who's been on hand as a, an invaluable aid to both students and scholars, but also to her colleagues in the Beinecke to tell them and explain and unlock the secrets of cartographic treasures um, now found in the rare book collection. And I loved this comment from uh, one of Margaret's colleagues who explains that she has just the right question to work out what researchers really want, not what they ask for which is often not the same thing at all. So um, given that information, I'm really looking forward to hearing Margaret's presentation and she'll be taking us into the Beinecke's rare map collection and linking it to Southeast Asia. So Margaret, it's over to you. Hello, this is uh, Margaret Key. Uh, can you hear me? I hope that you can see me. I cannot see myself, um, but I would like to start off with showing you uh, Yale's Chinese Maritime Atlas, which was uh, captured from, the, from a Chinese sailing junk in 1841 by the HMS Herald. The Chinese chunk was trading from the Gulf of Pechili in China to the Straits of Singapore. I took it up on myself and checked in the Royal Naval History Shiplock. And I found an entry regarding the HMS Herald. And it says the following quote of October 1841. And it reads, took a small force up the Canton River, raced to north of Wang Tang Fort to the ground, destroyed a number of chunks, and shot a few persons believed to have been guilty of treacherous contact. Now, during the period of 1841 and 1842, the HMS Herald was involved in the First Opium War and the actions of Canton in the fleet commanded by Sir William Parker. The British were commissioned by the East India Trading Company and they traded under many different names, the company, the British East India Trading Company and so on. Now the opium trade was significantly 
uh, in general trade to Singapore, which encouraged, which was encouraged by the British colonials who made a great profit from trading opium to the Chinese. Um, this is um, important. Now, what, what do the British get in return from the Chinese? Well, they got Chinese silk, they got spices, in particular tea and porcelain. Uh, also, I would like to point out um, again how the, the, the opium war, uh, how important that was to the British because they, it was very lucrative. And they, the British were interested in getting the Chinese uh, attracted to opium and so they can make a big profit. But then the Chinese government said that uh, we have too much crime now and we don't want it anymore. They even uh, installed a death penalty and the British wouldn't go along with it. They still traded and this is basically what started the first opium war. Now, when you look at the, the pictures here that uh, Siang put together for us so nicely, what you see here, this is a Chinese scholar published this book just a few years ago, based on our Chinese chart, manuscript chart. And Yale couldn't make the connection because we don't read Chinese, most of us. And, uh, but now Siang put it together. Now we can unite the modern uh, publication with the, with the Chinese chart. And what, what Siang is showing us here, she pointed out that it even shows the, the uh, Singapore in here. I think that yeah, this, this slide shows the hills of Singapore from the Straits of Singapore in, in our uh, sailing chart. Now that is remarkable that she found it. And I think everybody will be very excited to have that document at, at Yale, now that we know more about it. Now, when you look at the, these charts here, what, do they, what information do they, sh do they show? What, what, what does it mean? Well, the, the charts, as I told you before, were made for trading purposes. So these were like working maps. Uh, it describes the description of the sea, names of locations, notes of distances, directions of two places, depth of channels, beaches and sandbars, visible buildings, shapes and colors of natural objects. Now I will compare and I will show you a, a Portland chart of the Mediterranean, which also was used, the purpose of Portland charts, it's a generic name, it's your, they were also used for trading purposes. So they made their living trading in these seaports. So the chart you see here uh, was done by uh, an Italian and named Maggiolo. And he made a chart in Genoa. It shows the Mediterranean Sea. It shows the coast of Africa here on the left with local rulers and their tents. And they are made on vellum. So vellum, vellum is the skin of an animal. It could be a sheep or goat or deer, a small animal. And so it, it was treated with fresh egg white and then they applied natural colors to the skin of the animal. And somehow it, it's just amazing how it survived all these years. Now this is 1553, mm -hmm. the colors are very vivid. And this happened to be my favorite Portland chart at Yale and we have many. 
the bit, but this is just so beautiful. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit regarding about Portland charts in general. From the 5th to the 13th century, cartography was at, stand, was at a standstill. The exception was the Portland chart, which emerged at the end of the 13th century. It was a great advance over other products of medieval cartography. It was based on direct observation by means of a new instrument, the mariner's compass. They are characteristically single skins on vellum, as I told you before, with the neck visible. And they are beautiful executed with ports in red and the less important the seaports are marked in black. And they are radiating out from the, from the compass rose. And so they called run lines, but they're also referred to as wind directions and they were in different colors. The uh, black, four winds, half winds and quarter winds. So the black is usually the four winds then the half winds and then the quarter winds. Um, so it, it's, just, it's just a treasure. Uh, we have so many treasures at the Beinecke Library but I hope that someday you will come and look at the original uh, maps. And it, it's just, just a great experience just to look at them like an artwork. So what are they really used for? When you bring a class, what are they most interested in? And I give you an example of what just happened just before we got COVID. Uh, a, a Yale a famous painter from the Yale Art School brought his class to the Beinecke Library. And he explained to the class everything about the colors. They're all natural colors. They, some of them are derived from animal blood mixed with bark. Others are derived from herbs, herbal, uh, herbs mixed together and it, it just was so interesting to hear how the, the natural coloring works and how well the map is preserved. Um, now we have the earlier Portland chart and I don't have an image of it but the earliest Portland chart in America is located, or we have it here at the Beinecke Library. And it's a 1403, it's the Franciscus Beccarius job. And you can look it up in our Orbis catalog. The reason I didn't pull that because it's not so decorative. The, uh, the Portland chart that I pulled by Majolo is the one you see is much more decorative and much more beautiful but it doesn't take away. It was just a working map, trading map, just like the Chinese maritime atlas. So now the, the next map I want to uh, show you is, uh, or talk about, is the Martellus map. The Martellus map is hanging at the Beinecke Library and it's just a beautiful work of art. It's of uh, 1489. And this Martellus world map is one of the most important cartographical treasures ever received by Yale. This world map is drawn and painted on paper and backed on linen. It was done by a German uh, named Germanus Martellus. Martellus, who was living in Italy in, in circa 1480s, was drawing world maps. We know about uh, four more maps that he did, but none of the other maps are the, as large as this one that we have at Beinecke. Ours is extremely large. It's, it's 190 by 108 centimeters. So it's it's enormous, it's beautiful. So what is important about this 
map in particular, it, it is unique, the first world map to show the island of Z Zibangu or Japan, which Columbus was searching for. And it was also the first world map to have on it a graduated scale of longitude. This map hung, we believe, in a palazzo in Italy, was bought in Italy and then made its way to the United States to Yale, where it was given by an ominous donor to us. So I have now some personal, uh, a personal experience of how this map was used. And one stuck out in my mind in particular was, well, was about 20 years ago. And a, a Yale a, a professor, a brain surgeon came to me in the map department and said, I would like to have some copies of the Martellus map. So I asked him, would you mind sharing with me why you need the, what you need the copies for? So he said, well, I, we have a, a meeting. I have to give a lecture in Paris for other brain surgeons. And by showing them the Martellus map, I can tell them how far we are now with the brain research we know as much now about the human brain as we did when we looked at the world map of 1489, so before the discovery of America. So I thought that was very interesting. So now I have another story from my former boss, Alexander Vitor. When, when the map was uh, received by Yale in the 1960s, there was, again, a lot of text wasn't identified and they were not even sure whether it was a real manuscript or maybe it was printed. So Yale decided to take this Martellus map to have an x-ray at the Yale New Haven Hospital. So they put the map on a hospital bed and covered it with a sheet. And that created quite an interest of, of quite a stir and people saw what, what kind of a flat patient is under there being rolled rolled into the, the x-ray room. And it also I'd like to point out that a, a young scholar, Chet Van Duser, uh, was in charge just recently uh, through a multi-spectral imaging, which they did at Beinecke regarding the map to find text, to discover text that has been, that disappeared over time. And they, the group was able to do it. And so that it was very exciting for everybody. And Chet Van Duser just published a, a book regarding that research a few years ago. And you can, we have a, his book at the Beinecke Library, so you can uh, look it up in Orbis if you're interested in learning a little more. But that just shows you how the historical maps are always used for different purposes, and they, they're always, always in the always in demand. So from the Martellus map, we're going to to jump to the, the map of 1511 uh, by Silvani. Uh, so why would I jump from 1489 before the discovery of America uh, to a map of 1511? Well, one of the, well, there are two reasons. One that it shows, you can see already, it shows the discovery part of the new world already. And the, the second uh, one is there was the first map, well, it came in an atlas, and it was the first map that was printed in two colors. It's an engraving, a wood engraving, and then it was typeset for the first time in red and in black. So there was a very tedious 
work. And, uh, but they still did it and it, it came out beautiful. Also, I want to point out, you can see in this map of 1511, the, the medieval notion, I think you even see some sea monsters lurking somewhere. Uh, it, it's a typical sort of medieval map. It was made on a heart-shaped projection. And then we see the very scientific map but used for trading purposes that I showed you of 1553, and also the Chinese maritime map for trading. These were working maps. They, they made money for the sailors. And, and then you see this map here in comparison. So the medieval notion versus the very scientific maps. And uh, so there we have um, we're going to jump now to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about secret escape maps. And we have, uh, oh, maybe, maybe 100 silk maps. This is just an example. But the reason I picked the area because it, it covers Asia and Southeast Asia. And so now the... Um, Escape maps were issued, World War II escape maps, they were issued during World War II in the United States in Great Britain. Produced in excess of 3.5 million silk maps on cloth for allied military personnel to use as escape maps. Now in the 1940s, the British military intelligence unit known as MI9, started issuing these silk maps for use by British air crews shut down over enemy occupied territory. The silk maps were intended to assist airmen in avoiding capture. Now that was the primary mission. Whatever you do, just think one way of you have to escape. So the M I-9 also smuggled silk and tissue escape maps into POW camps in Germany, along with other escape aids to encourage POWs to attempt escape. After the US entry into World War II, the US military intelligence officers learned of the activities of MI-9 and established a similar intelligence unit referred to as MISX. And they began mass producing cloth maps and tissue paper scape maps for US military personnel. The first US cloth maps were printed on balloon cloth. We have actually uh, one I think it came over to the Beinig as well. Um, so, but the material with the, was not really suitable. So then they produced uh, escape maps on excitate rayon and silk, and it was found that it was much more suitable. Now the AAF, that's what you have here, Air Force, Army Air Force cloth maps. Their charts, these charts were lifesavers for many Air Force pilots. They were sewn into the lining of the uniform jacket, jackets. They were easy to fold and the resilience of a cloth map is so useful. Now, what do these maps roughly show? <clears throat> They're showing roadways, electric power lines, trails, cities, and towns. So now, if I still have time, I'd like to talk uh, quickly about uh, locating maps of Singapore within the uh, Yale Orbis catalog. So it is not 
if you look up an Orbis catalog and you just look under Singapore, you find very few maps. So you have to expand. You have to look under bordering states and countries and areas, like under look under Malaysia, look at the keyword Malaysia maps, and then you can also put a date on it or dates uh, uh, span that you're interested. So Malaysia, Malaya, Brunei, Borneo, Sarawak, Southeast Asia, Indonesia. And of all places, I found a nice insect, which Siang was kind enough to, she did a fantastic job, created that image here for us, and even marked it as Singapore, beautiful map of 1851 on a map of Borneo. Who would have thought that? So you have to just to do a lot of detective work and you also have to check in, in atlases because it doesn't necessarily mean that the title of the atlas will reflect what's in the atlas. For instance, it, even an atlas of the world could have maps of Singapore, Southeast Asia in it. So you just have to, to do some detective work. It, it's a lot of work but you will eventually find it. Um, so again, I, I want to thank everybody very much for uh, attending this meeting. And I'm very grateful to Siang how she made it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. That was absolutely terrific. It really wants really encourages us all to travel to Yale or to look at the uh, Yale websites and find out what's there in the Beinecke Library. Um, really inspirational. So if at this stage I can invite all the speakers to switch their cameras on and um, we can move into the Q&A session. So cameras on, that is absolutely fantastic. There have been a number of questions coming through. So thank you everybody in the audience who have been contributing. I'll try and get round to all of them, but I'm going to be a bit cheeky at first and I want to ask my own question to start things off. And it, it's a question for all three of our speakers, really. I'm interested to know how the collections you've been describing have built up and who were the people behind these collections? Who got them going? Who made them happen? Um, I, Tom sort of hinted at it in his chat, but um, if we start with Martine, as he was the first speaker, any thoughts there, Martine? Um, yeah, I think I tried to uh, present all those people who uh, were behind this collection, collecting of uh, maps. So, in many cases, these are private uh, persons who uh, started their own private map collection, which eventually uh, ended up in an institution, a library or a, a museum uh, afterwards. Um, Thank yeah. you. Tom, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that, that the India Office map collection is, is slightly different in that it was also a map producing collection. So actually, in many cases, the, the, um, the, the, the government of, of, of India from London was generating maps as well, which found their way into the archives. Um, but yes, I don't, I don't think you can, you, can, you can probably identify certain individuals, um, such as Clements Markham, of course, um, in the late 19th century. But, but really, I think that the, the collection of maps to support and facilitate company um, business was really the first. So I don't, I don't think it's possible to really identify too many individuals throughout that, which, which, which of course makes it very different from uh, the collections that, that, that Martin has described. And also the, the, the topographical collection of George III, which was largely assembled by his librarians for him. Thanks, Tom. Um, Margaret, is there anything you'd like to add on the yes. Beinecke? Yes, I would like to... Um... The, uh, the collection, the maps came over from Stirling Memorial Library 
uh, we had uh, my former boss, Alexander Vitor, and they called him a dollar a year man. <laughs> he come, <laughs> he, that his, was his salary, a dollar a year. But he was independently wealthy and he put even his own family money into purchasing many, many of the maps that are real treasures. And we, we shouldn't forget when he bought these maps, I think he started in the 1940s and 50s. So they were so cheap compared to what they are now. And, and now they worth, some of the maps are worth millions that he collected and for Yale. So he was the main person behind. He also taught at Yale, but he was a real map scholar. So we, we start building, Yale started building the collection thanks to Alexander Ovito. And uh, of course, then as the years went by, we had uh, some wonderful donors and so on, and some maps were bought later, but nothing like Mr. Vitro had provided. Thank you, Margaret. Well, that's a nice range of uh, input, both from our speakers and from these wonderful people who are creating our map collections uh, over the centuries. Now, a number of people have been contributing questions, and I see from the chat that Martine has already answered a few, so thank you, Martine. But, um, I would be tempted to revisit some of the questions that Martine has already answered. Um, for, one, for the benefit of those people who haven't been following the Q&A, but they're very interesting subjects. And I think Tan Avoka, have I got that right? Um, asks the question, what types of information about uh, slavery are reflected in maps? And I think this was generated from Martine's paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, when you look at research on the history of slavery in the Netherlands, it's almost completely focused on the West Indies, the um, um, plantation economy there, um, but uh, much less on the East Indies. And we know that um, the Dutch East India Company, um, well, slavery was, uh, um, was a thing uh, in, that, um, in that context too. And we know, uh, for instance, about some fortification plans, VOC fortresses, uh, on which uh, rooms uh, where the slaves lived um, are indicated. And on the other hand, on commercial printed maps, you see uh, sometimes uh, depictions of enslaved people in the allegorical, um, um, how do you say that? <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you, Martin. Um, next up is uh, Francis Gasgonia, who asks uh, two questions, really. How were indigenous cartographers credited? And also, and this is a question probably again for Martin and also Tom, were there any indigenous cartographers who were used to work for the British or Dutch East India companies. So as you're on screen, Martin, do you want to start with that? Okay. Um, yeah, we, uh, some three years ago, we organized a conference in our library, Mapping Asia, on which we focused on this uh, connection between West and East. And uh, this subject actually was um, one of, um, one of the subjects that was addressed there. And I remember uh, Professor Ormeling uh, gave a lecture on the history of the topographic service in the Netherlands East Indies. And he talked a bit about um, uh, local uh, people who were employed and later um, um, working for the topographical service. And in some uh, cases, uh, they their names are indicated uh, on the maps as one of the people who contributed to, to these maps. So, uh, and over time, we know that um, the share of the people who were working for the topographical service were uh, local um, people. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's a, it's certainly a similar situation with with the maps in the in the India office collection. There are, there are a number of. Um, in indigenous produced 
maps there, um, but, but very, very rarely, almost never do we actually know who produced them. Um, and I mean, for example, the, the maps of um, Tibet in the, in, the, in the British Library, um, studied extensively by Dr. Diana Langer, um, who was able to identify exactly who, what this visionary um, map maker's name was. And, you know, the fact is that throughout history, these maps have been known um, through the people who collected them rather than the, the people who did them. Um, I think um, certainly with the large scale topographical mapping like the Survey of India um, and throughout the 19th century, there are, you know, there are Indians working on the survey as well, very much. And that's very much a part of a part of this, this process of mapping India by, by the company. Um, but again, very rarely are these, are these names, do these names uh, survive to us. Thank you, Tom. Great. Um, our next question is from Fiona Tan. And Fiona's question is quite a long one, but it is an interesting one. I think it's all three speakers may have a, a view on this. Uh, maps are powerfully visual items. What are the challenges in terms of maintaining or perhaps reconciling the contexts of maps? For instance, how would one research into the surrounding records about the creation of such maps when these collections might sometimes be cleaved from their more administrative counterparts precisely because of preservation reasons, for example, for flat storage or for commercial reasons if they were kept by private collectors, for instance. And I think this question very much reflects what Joy Slapnig was saying at last week's session when she was asking certainly in relation to Corriton's Burmese collection, should they live in archives or should they live in libraries? What's the way forward? Um, anybody want to take a view on that? Um, yes, I can. Thanks, Tom. I can certainly, I can, I can certainly begin. And, and yes, I mean, this idea of the, the context of a map, understanding what it is and, and where it comes from it is, is you know, in, an incredibly important way of using maps for research. And it's also true, as, as the question rightly um, points out, um, that quite often these previous contexts or marks of ownership were, were erased as a map processed through, through time. I think maps have many different contexts. Um, and, you know, it's, it's certainly our duty as, as custodians to record those and explore those where we can and we do that for example through cataloging through doing our best to reference anywhere a map has been former owners um, trying to understand the map more and to look at it and try and work out where it's from we've got a, a, a number of vellum produced maps in the library that have only survived because they were used as the bindings of, of books because vellum's you know pretty durable um, so actually you know when you look closely you can see the former context of, of, of these objects as well. Uh, another example of where we would do this is through virtually reunifying um, map collections digitally, which I, I touched on in my in my presentation, and which Martin also did. Thank you, Tom. Martin, uh, uh, either of you want to contribute? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I I uh, showed the example in the National Archives in the 19th century. The maps were separated from the arch archives where they belong to. Um, they're, so they're now in a process to restore those links um, between the maps and the, the archives. Um, but in a private map collection, such as the Bodo Nijenhuis collection in Leiden, um, well, um, those links are in many cases uh, um, completely lost because he collected only the map we have a few examples that a uh, description or a kind of uh, archival document is still uh, kept with the map, but in most cases we only have the maps and we have about 80 manuscripts VOC maps in our collection, um, but we don't even know how um, Bodel Nijenhuis uh, got these maps. So that really needs a lot of uh, research and um, also um, researching into the history of collecting and looking to auction catalogues and so on to, to try to find uh, hints what, what those uh, backgrounds of these maps could be. 
that is very important to, to find these, but we're not always able uh, um, to say immediately. Thank you, Martijn. And Margit, do you have anything to add? I think uh, for this purpose, I think that the cross references on the main catalog record, they are very extremely important. Now put a cross reference on your record, say such and such is kept here. So you make the connection, you know, even under just under notes in your main cataloging record. You can just put it under notes. We have that, we, we really have this problem with the, I had that problem at, at Yale in the map department. They, they, they took out maps from, from atlases and we didn't know where they came from. I had text with them. So the, the researchers were asking for them and we didn't know where they came from. So it's always good to make a note and we call them cross references. Thank you, Margie. Well, I think all three answers have demonstrated the value of um, librarians maintaining their collections and all the intellectual interlinking of different aspects of the collection. So thank you for that. Now we're going to move on considerably because we have two questions on the same subject, which refer to georeferencing. Uh, Jane Jacobs asked if you could tell, Martine, if you could tell us more about crowdsourcing work done on the islands south of Singapore. That was the last slide you showed, I think. Um, how was the work set up and managed? And what gains in understanding were there from crowdsourcing work? And I will just move on because Vera Dorofeva Lichtman also asked Tom, um, could you please give more detail on the georeferencing project at the British Library? Is each map just roughly georeferenced and superimposed on a modern map? Or are there cases of detailed georeferencing? So, Tom, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm happy to. Um, the, the British Library has been georeferencing its maps for um, for many years now. Um, it's it's a crowdsourcing project. Um, um, so thank you very much to all of our volunteers for georeferencing our our maps um, and doing it so well as well. I mean, I. We're not quite sure of the, the question of roughly georeferencing or more detailed georeferencing, but you know, hundreds of location points matching up a, a digitized early map with a with a base map. It seems to me quite quite detailed. And and that information is then extracted and stored and used to create geotiffs as well. And we've got a number of our map collections, such as the GOAD maps, fire insurance maps of London that are now. In existence as um, geotiffs that have been used for all sorts of other things, just, just as an example. Thank you, Tom. My time? Yeah, I can add to that that it heavily depends on the type of maps uh, which are georeferenced, what the quality is. So I think I pointed that out in my last slide that um, specifically the more recent and larger scale maps, topographical maps, series, city plans, and so on. Um, can be uh, georeferenced um, pretty accurate. So you can make an almost perfect overlay on a modern uh, map. But uh, we have had some um, manuscript charts from the 18th century in our um, georeferencing projects. And um, these maps were uh, less accurate uh, and a typical thing of coastal charts is that bays and inlets are kind of exaggerated. So it's um, you can never get a really good overlay uh, with, with this type of map. Uh, so it depends really on the, the type of map you are georeferencing, um, how accurately that can be done and how you can use the, the results in further research. So would both of you recommend georeferencing as a way forward? I do, <laughs> uh, as, yeah, and I as well for uh, for these older, less accurate maps, so to say, because uh, for us, it is also a means to uh, make our map collection uh, searchable in a geographical way. So you start with a modern world map, you zoom in on a region you're interested in, or you type in a place name, and all the georeference maps of that region uh, pop up as results. And 
for that uh, purposes, it's it's not necessary that all the maps are perfectly georeferenced. So when it's only possible to roughly georeference a map, it's uh, it's still valuable um, uh, then. Yeah, and just I mean, just quickly, I think Martin makes makes a really good point about the georeferencing of very early maps, um, which which continues to be um, interesting. Um, and also, I mean, I mentioned that the King's Graphical Collection, uh, 18,000 images will, will be released on Flickr Commons next week. Um, there'll also be the opportunity to geo-reference them as well. So uh, to everyone out there, we'll watch out for the opportunity. Fantastic, thank you, Tom. Um, there are a couple of questions which would require very specific answers. And I think they're probably best left if both Margit and Tom could have a look in the chat. One about prime meridian of the Marcellus map for Margit and Tom, a specific question on uh, Kolkata and the research you're working on it. So those are questions from Victoria Marshall and from Paul Hughes. Um, I'm aware we're coming towards the end of the session, but Jane has, Jane Jacobs has asked a very interesting question for everybody, um, which is to look at the advantages of the intensification of digitization. Tom has mentioned some of those, but are there disadvantages of digitization? Um, more reproduction, more distributed access, what has changed in the curatorial or collecting philosophy of libraries and museums that has led to the sharing that we see today and which projects like the Singapore one currently up and running like ours can benefit from? Tom, you're on screen. Do you want to uh, go for it? I, I can, and, and I think as I as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, I mean, the, the, the world has changed incredibly, it, certainly in the last 10 years with the availability of uh, digital maps available online, and in the, the last six months as well, where we, we, we have an obligation to make our collections as available for as many people as, as possible. Um, I, I, you know, I can't really think of any downside to digitization and making collections available in this way that if there are, there are large enough to, to, to make us think twice about doing that. I think we can always be and should always be learning about how best to digitize maps. Um, and there, you know, there, are, there are many issues and interesting aspects. You know, maps throughout their history have always been tricky objects, you know, right from the start of the maps in the East India Company archives, unwieldy documents. Um, digitizing a very big map is, is very, very tricky. Um, and displaying it on a, you know, on a PC, on a computer screen, um, such a large file to be as useful and used by people is also very, very tricky. Um, but I think as, you know, as part of this forum and as part of, as part of the community of people who use map, this is, this is how we improve. I hope that's answered answered the question in, in some way. Thank you, Tom. Martin, well, do you want to add something very briefly? Uh, yes, um, I can't think of any disadvantages of um, digitizing uh, map collections, actually. Um, um, the de recent developments are also towards triple IF, which is um, kind of protocol in which you can easily um, exchange maps through different collections and use them in all kinds of digital environments. Um, and an other development is that more and more institutions um, offer their high resolution images of uh, maps and other special collections for free. So we did that ourselves. So everything which is in our digital collections um, um, database can be downloaded uh, in high resolution for free if there are no uh, copyright issues uh, to the material. So I think that's uh, only uh, very positive uh, developments. Um, adding to that, I think that the materiality aspects of maps um, shouldn't be um, left out in the future research. So what we do with uh, students and uh, researchers in our university is they still come to the library uh, to be able to study the original material. Of course, the last half year, it is um, a bit less easy than before, but um, hopefully we uh, can be back on track soon uh, with that physical. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Well, I think, bearing in mind, and looking at the clock, we're very close to the end of this session. So I'd just like to wrap up by thanking all our speakers who gave us wonderfully enlightening views into their collections. We were able to look at a whole nation's collections, thanks to Martijn in the Netherlands. We were to look at the British Library, a massive map collection, and also to focus on one company's particular collection within there, and also a chance to look at usage. And Margaret gave us a brilliant show and tell around what Yale has to offer which was a real eye-opener. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody for their contributions today. And I think now I should just pass on to Siang to close things down. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, thank you to all our wonderful speakers for today, uh, Ms. Margaret Kay, Mr. Tom Harper, and Mr. Martin Storms. And with that, we conclude the third session collections in our workshop series, Unlocking Historical Maps, Collections, Circulations, Publics. I hope that all of you in the audience found the talks and discussion to be thought-provoking and informative. We invite you all to join us again next Wednesday, the 9th of October, and that's a week from today. At the same time, um, 7 to uh, 9 p.m. Singapore time, for the next session, Publics, where we will hear from scholars and curators from the National Library of Singapore and the Royal Geographical Society in London about their work of developing public exhibitions and platforms for sharing access of digitized historical maps. For registration or more information, please click on the link that is currently displaying in the chat function under your screen. The webinar has come to an end and we will be closing the stream, but we look forward to seeing you all on the 9th of October. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Thank you very much.